The GI Research Foundation was able to produce this podcast with a sponsorship from Takeda. If we can track these patients from the time that the pouch is created to the time that they develop their disease, we can determine the progression of events. We can see things happen before the development of disease. Welcome to Visceral, the new podcast from the Gastrointestinal Research Foundation's Gut Instincts, where we explore the ins and outs of digestive health science with leaders in the field and those who have been impacted by living with digestive diseases. My name is Anna Gomberg, and I work at the University of Chicago Digestive Diseases Center at the University of Chicago Medicine. With me today is my friend Eugene Chang, uh, we call Jean, the Martin Boyer Professor of Medicine and Director of the Digestive Diseases Research Core Center. Jean is also the Associate Director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center at the University of Chicago Medicine and overall living legend in digestive diseases research. Dr. Chang has spent his entire career over 30 years conducting basic, translational, and clinical research in digestive diseases, including the inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. For the last several years, he has employed his not inconsiderable expertise investigating the intestinal microbiome. Thank you for being with us today for this first episode of Visceral. Uh, to get started, one interesting fact about you, Dr. Chang, is that you were trained as an MD, a medical doctor, a clinician, a person who treats patients, but you have also basically built your career in research and all kinds of research, basic, translational, and clinical research. Uh, I have had the privilege of hearing you speak a little bit about what that means for you, but maybe you could tell us more about how that perspective informs your work and what has that meant for your research program in your lab. I see having an MD as being an advantage yeah. because uh, you're able to see what the problems are and uh, what unmet needs need to be uh, addressed. Um, so this is what I do day to day. I, I'm the, the person who generates the ideas. I decide uh, the, the direction of our research. Uh, almost everything that we do in the lab is directed to answering a particular question that is of clinical relevance. And that truly means that you're taking basic science research and kind of always are focused on what good that might do for patients in the end. I should mention that, you know, we don't just do basic science research. Our, our research program and programs really span from basic to translational to clinical. We, we actually have uh, several studies that involve uh, study of patient populations. I actually, in looking at your CV and looking at all of the kinds of work that you've done, even prior to, I feel like, the last 10 years, which has really been microbiome-focused, and uh, it is, it's every kind of study uh, that can be done in this area. Um, what you know, just in touching on that, what drew you to IBD research? What drew you to digestive diseases in general as a person um, rather than even as a scientist? So th this was interesting because uh, I really wasn't doing IBD research and I didn't have any clinical expertise in taking care of IBD patients until I would say the early 1990s. And at that time, uh, the chairman of medicine was Arthur Rubenstein. Yeah. And uh, Arthur decided that we needed to have a basic science or translational science program in inflammatory bowel diseases. And I think that was associated with uh, some grant funding that he had yeah. received to start the program. And a national search was done, uh, of which uh, I think that many candidates came to interview for it to run that program. But as it turned out, they um, decided that um, they would look at me as an internal candidate. And ultimately, that's how I got into IBD. It was very fortuitous because uh, there's a lot to be discovered in IBD. Yeah. There, there are many unmet needs, uh, huge gaps in knowledge, and um, this became um, a primary interest of mine. Yeah. Well, I've heard you say, kind of thinking about your career, that you would like to be part of the cure for IBD. I would. The cure and the effective treatment. Do you I mean, think that we're close? Um, 
no. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's because IBD is not a single disorder. Um, we know, for example, there's Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Well, there are different types of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis as well. I view it as uh, a set of diseases that present as two clinical phenotypes, yeah. Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But there are many causes and there are many factors. So to say that, you know, I would cure IBD in my lifetime, I would say that's probably not going to happen. It's like saying, you know, yeah. I'm going to cure cancer. Well, yeah. there's so many different types of cancers that... Uh, it, we can cure some, but uh, we're not going to be able to cure everything, yeah. uh, not within my lifetime. Well, I've also heard, build, building on what you just said about the many different types of IBD, which is something that Dr. Rubin and Dr. No, everyone who works here would underscore that we, we just don't know enough about these uh, clinical phenotypes, as you said, to be as descriptive as we need to be. One of the things that I remember hearing you say, one of the first lectures I remember hearing you give, you said, well, I don't really think the colon is one organ. Uh, and I've heard you expound a little bit on the digestive system in general. What is that? What do you mean by the colon might not be one organ? And what are scientists doing to answer that or to investigate that further? Well, um, that's a uh, great question. Uh, if you look at our GI tract, it's actually multiple organs, right? And right. Not, not just like the liver and pancreas, which are outside of the luminal GI tract, but um, it, each part of the intestinal tract is a, a different organ. Your stomach is different from your esophagus, uh, your duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and colon. And, you know, the colon does have the... the front of the colon has a different function from the uh, back end of the uh, colon. So these are uh, organs uh, that have specific function and gene expression, yeah. but they're just connected in series. Yeah. And so I view the GI tract as sort of like an assembly line, right? <laughs> uh, cool. you, you start with uh, eating food and, and then it gets digested. It goes through various processes, it goes through the stomach, it, uh, acid is produced and it, it's broken down and then you enter the small intestine and its role is largely to uh, further digest it and absorb the nutrients. Then when it comes to the colon, uh, I think part of it is that uh, whatever is left is uh, meal a meal for the microbiome sure. um, and there I think that uh, the microbiome produces many many molecules uh, metabolites that have benefit to us yeah. and are absolutely essential yeah. uh, and deficiencies or imbalances in the microbiome can potentially cause or contribute to the development of inflammatory bowel diseases right. So um, I look at the, uh, the GI tract as a very, very complex system. Mm -hmm. But it's the complexity that really attracts me to understanding how all these parts mm -hmm. come together yeah. and functions uh, in, in a way that we don't even think about uh, what goes on in our digestive processes. Most of us are not affected at all. It's... It's so complicated with so many moving parts, and yet it works so well for most people. Well, it works so smoothly and so well until it doesn't. And, yes. and that is the, the, the truly remarkable clinical stories we hear all the time are about patients that are fine, and then they take a trip or they have some sort of, they go to college, and then they come back three months later with Full, full blown and ulcerative colitis, and we don't really know how that happens. Um, but I think some of the work that you're looking at um, is certainly helping to elucidate what those mechanisms are. At uh, a recent continuing medical education program we did, you shared what I have come to think of as one of my favorite slides, um, which I'll include in our show notes. 
And in that slide, you see the rise of the Western diet throughout the world over time and the corresponding rise of IBD. And I think it's kind of fascinating that your research focuses primarily on the microbiome, which is like the teeny tiny interior. And yet you were zooming out uh, to basically the whole world to see that these patterns were emerging. How does microbiome research relate to this global phenomenon, these uh, epidemiological trends? And with these trends, can we improve individuals' microbiomes to help stem the tide of inflammatory bowel disease? Um, and basically, what, it, what does that look like to you? Actually, this, this is what we study, right? right. We're, we're looking at environmental, dietary, uh, lifestyle factors that impact the, uh, these trillions of microbes uh, that live within us. The, these microbes make up uh, uh, a vital organ. They, they, are, um, they provide uh, functions that we absolutely need. Now, that did not come about uh, just by chance. Sure. Uh, we, are, we select our microbes very, very carefully. And, and I would even say uh, that we evolved uh, with our microbes. Uh, and this is... Uh, and we evolved in a way that we tr we create it through our own genes and uh, physiology ecosystems that attract uh, certain types of microbes that uh, will benefit us. Um, that uh, relationship that has happened for thousands of years has now been altered by what we're doing to ourselves. We're changing, we've changed our diet, uh, we've changed our uh, lifestyle, we've, the environment has changed, uh, we eat um, uh, you know, more animal-based foods rather than uh, plant-based foods. And you can imagine that our um, genetics and our biology has not caught up with that. I mean, we shifted this within the past 100 to 200 years, but this relationship that we have with our microbes in the environment, I mean, that has happened over eons. Mm -hmm. And um, so this mismatch mm -hmm. leads to uh, higher risk for these disorders that we never saw or rare, rarely saw a couple hundred years ago. IBD is fairly new age disorder. Yeah. You know, back in the early 1800s, it was uncommon. And now it's, you were seeing uh, trends where it's increasing in prevalence uh, and incidence in countries that were previously, you know, developing and now have become as industrialized and westernized as uh, the United States is. So it's clearly... Uh, a, IBD is an example of a disorder that um, in many ways uh, was really created by us, <laughs> right? Sure. Um, now, there is certainly a genetic basis for this, but it's unlikely that over 200 years that you would have enough drift in population sure. genetics to explain that. So it really has to be changes in our environment, lifestyle, and diet. What was it? So in the 90s, let's say the, when Judy Cho, Cho. Cho, when Judy Cho, in the 90s when Judy Cho and and the team here that worked to develop, to, to identify the NOD2 gene, it must have seemed, I, I know that from looking at your research, that, you know, gene, that was the focus, and then we discovered that there were so many genes associated that it was it was it became sort of a less important focus in the research paradigm. But is there, I guess, what was that shift like? What did it what did it feel like when we sort of said, okay, well, there's a lot of genetic associations. We know that, but we need to look more deeper and look at something else. Yeah. So you know uh, the the discovery of Nod two mm. uh, as uh, a risk variant. For largely for Crohn's disease, yeah. uh, was um, I think a landmark finding because 
What Nod2 does is it's part of our immune system, our, our surveillance of these microbes that live within us. Yeah. Uh, and um, in fact, the stimulus or the, the, uh, the factor that activates Nod2 is a product of bacteria, gut bacteria. And when it was discovered, to me, what I realized was that our immune system has evolved in a way to recognize good from bad bacteria yeah. and, or microbes. Um, and I, I would say that um, that really uh, underscored the importance of the gut microbiome in diseases like IBD. Um, at that time, or shortly thereafter, you know, I remember uh, asking um, at a conference, well, has anyone looked at the microbiome? And is there a way that we can study it? And I think the speaker at that point said, uh, no, it, it, we can't look at the microbiome. Wow. And um, that was not a very satisfying answer no. to me. So I started uh, to look around, and it happened that we have an incredible group of microbiologists and microbiome science people at Argonne National Laboratory. Now, they have been doing microbiome research for years, but really the microbiome that's in the soil or in the oceans and environment. But they had developed the tools that allowed us to look at human as well as uh, other mammalian microbiomes. And that's where we began in, in the early 2000s. And I think we were among the very first groups to start looking at the gut microbiome. Um, so I think that uh, a lot of things have happened in the past two decades. Uh, what we couldn't do 20 years ago we can do very well right yeah. now. We have very advanced technologies to look at these trillions of organisms mm -hmm. in many different ways and how they can impact our own biology, physiology, mm -hmm. development. Uh, so, you know, it's really been a thrill yeah. to be in this field. It would seem that some of what scientists and technology have gotten better at in recent years is managing and computing these big data sets, correct? Like trillions and trillions of pieces of information, which present really big opportunities, but also really big challenges. How does funding factor into the process of doing this research, and how does independent funding help accelerate and contribute to your discoveries? Well, so funding is uh, largely uh, through um, the... National Institutes of Health. At least that's uh, where we get most of our funding. Now, uh, the NIH is very conservative in uh, in how it funds uh, projects. Uh, they 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 you have to show uh, feasibility and merit, which means that uh, you have to uh, do a lot of studies to convince them that you have something that is going to be turn out to have um, significance. Mm -hmm. That's hard to do, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how, how do you get started if, uh, to, to get this data mm -hmm. if you don't have other sources of funding? Uh, you have to have an organization like GERF that is willing to take a risk mm -hmm. and give investigators the opportunity to explore areas that otherwise would not would be considered too risky by the NIH and that has been I think our uh, secret sauce over the past uh, 40 years that I've been associated with GERF um, they have been generous and uh, helped us in really getting uh, into areas that are uncharted. Mm -hmm. And that has 
uh, paid off in huge dividends of, because we're now very able to compete for these large grants from the NIH. Uh, the most recent one, for example, is called an RC2. It's focused on ulcerative colitis. It's a team science grant. Yeah. So the RC2 is uh, a, a clinical investigation that uses um, what we call multi-omic approaches. This is like uh, the kind of uh, DNA sequencing that we bring, in, but also things like measurements of metabolites, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, this is this is a uh, grant or a project that involves 30, 40 people uh, that go from um, clinical, I mean, David is very much part of it, Sushila is part of it. Um, they help us get the uh, patient specimens and they do the endoscopy and, and get the samples. And then we take the samples and we do a variety of things. But the bottom line of this is that it's a human model where we can ga gain insights into the cause yeah. of IBD. Uh, why? Because this is, uh, we followed this group of ulcerative colitis patients who have undergone the removal of their colon, uh, and then they have a pseudo rectum that's fashioned from the uh, remaining part of the small bowel. Um, about half of these patients will develop a inflammatory condition uh, within a couple of years called pouchitis. Mm -hmm. um, and what this uh, allows us to do is if we can track these patients from the time that the pouch is created to the time that they develop their disease, we can determine the progression of events. We can see things happen before the development of disease. That has not been possible uh, in a regular clinical population. Um, patients that we see are patients who have already developed uh, their inf inflammatory response uh, and had complications. And so this is uh, whatever we're measuring is after the fact. It, it, it's probably a consequence of the immune and inflammatory process. So with the uh, Palchitis Project, we can track the events that lead up to why a individual would develop Palchitis. And in doing so, we made two discoveries. Uh, and actually, this was uh, when we were funded through the initial Human Microbiome Project. So this project been going on for over 10 years. Yeah. But two discoveries were made. One on the patient side, and uh, this, this showed that these uh, patients uh, with ulcerative colitis, they're, they're genetically wired differently. I, I can tell you that we have uh, indisputable evidence that they respond very, very differently to microbial signals than you and me. Um, and the, uh, in the initial 17 patients that we published on, um, all of these patients exhibited the same genetic response. And then this, a year later, after we published these results, uh, the the University of North Carolina group published almost the identical uh, response that was seen in Crohn's patients. This does not involve, to our knowledge, any of the genetic variants that yeah. have been reported. This is something that probably arises from uh, something that the microbes do in changing uh, the chemistry of our genes. So it's not changing the backbone structure, but it's adding these groups so that it alters gene expression. It's, mm -hmm. it's what we call epigenetics. epigenetics yeah. 
And uh, yesterday, I saw the data that uh, my colleagues, um, Sebastian Pott and Oni Basu, who are in uh, genetic medicine here, they, sh they showed me some incredible data from, from these patients. And it's very clear that whatever is driving this uh, anomalous response to microbial signals is being uh, done through epigenetic modification. Wow. And uh, what's the other discovery? So on the, the other discovery is on the um, microbe side. So this was largely work that was done by a former faculty member here. Um, um, Marin, A. Murat Aaron, right? This 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 guy is a genius, right? Yeah. He's so far ahead of uh, the field in thinking about and studying uh, the microbiome, but he 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 observed that uh, a particular microbial population that we often saw right before the development of pouchitis, um, he found that there was something genetically different between that organism that was at the mucosal surface versus that in the uh, luminal fluid. And that's something that, uh, to cut uh, to the chase here, uh, appears also to involve epigenetic modification. Um, I didn't know that bacteria could undergo epigenetic modification, but it is clear that, and this is something, again, where we had to bring in an expert, uh, uh, Tal Pan, who is a professor, uh, another very brilliant person, but he identified uh, uh, parts of the DNA that were being modified by these microbes. And I don't have the answer yet. It certainly seems like you're getting close. How much longer on the RC2 grant? We have two more years. Is the study design, which is longitudinal, unique? Um, and is it necessary because of the diversity of the microbiome in individuals? It's the only way to study the microbiome because everybody's microbiome is different. Yeah. So the way that we design our studies is that the patient or subject is always their own control, yeah. and we do longitudinal studies. Again, this is largely through uh, GERF. GERF gave us uh, funding to get, uh, you know, build a notobiotic facility. This is a mouse facility where my mice are brought up in a germ-free environment. They don't have any microbes. That, has, that was a huge um, asset for us, an opportunity for us to really gain an understanding of what microbes do to us. Yeah. We also, uh, GERF was uh, also provided funding for some technologies that uh, allow us to look at gene expression of uh, single cells. Sure. Okay, so this was uh, an instrument called the Codex machine that uh, Dr. Jabri mm -hmm. is now running and uh, uh, making discoveries from. Uh, and then there was uh, another instrument called... Uh, uh, the GeoMix nanostring uh, spatial transcriptomics. That basically, we can see the gene expression of individual cells in in situ. Yeah. All right. So, and and this is something that um, is being used by many investigators now at the university, and it's it it really enables us to answer questions that we could not. Uh, answer before. We're very fortunate because uh, uh, not many institutions would be able to provide such a, a wide scope of enabling technologies as well as uh, the sort of infrastructure that's necessary for um, really uh, addressing difficult questions. Uh, I know that we're getting close to wrapping up, but uh, I have one more question, which I think we could maybe call wild speculation. Uh, are there any areas 
in your research that you just have a hunch about or discoveries or advancements that you think the next few years will bring to the field of digestive diseases? So uh, we're into prevention. I have, uh, it's a challenge to find a cure or cures. Um, I think it is possible, but the thing is that if we can prevent disease, we wouldn't have to cure a disease, right? So uh, that's the problem in in our field right now, uh, IBD, that that is we, we don't know if we could figure out who's at risk, yeah. then we could introduce interventions at that early stage. Your outcomes are going to be so much better. Uh, so I'm into looking for biomarkers or um, other developing metrics to determine uh, whose microbiome might be imbalanced or um, uh, uh, unhealthy. Uh, We can use that information along with somebody's, let's say, genetic profile. Um, We could test to see whether they have this anomalous gene expression. You put all that together, you could probably stratify... um, not patients, but, you know, relatives or individuals that may be beginning to develop some problems uh, to determine whether they're high risk. If they're high risk, then you can introduce Mm -hmm. um, interventions to lower the risk. Mm -hmm. What kind of interventions? Well, I think that it could be as simple as changing diet. Now, I understand that that's very difficult to do, and most people aren't going to stick with it. Right. Uh, but you know, it's very interesting. I, I think that there are, um, if we could develop a metric yeah. that tells uh, individuals that you have an unhealthy microbiome, you yeah. keep on going this way, you're likely to develop or at, be at risk for developing uh, some disorder. Um, But if I could say, look, I'm going to introduce, let's say, a dietary intervention and show you that your microbiome is getting better, that we're uh, repairing it, rebuilding it, that's a huge incentive. And how do you know this? How do I know this? Well, we have several patients where we're monitoring their microbiome um, and when they see, when we present their data to them, even before they're feeling better, and they're so motivated. Uh, and this one patient of ours we have, who came in with a very, very uh, damaged microbiome, uh, having been placed on 18 months of antibiotics 10 yeah. years ago, he developed a lot of GI symptoms. We looked at his microbiome, and it was damaged. He was missing a lot of major uh, groups that we absolutely need for good health. So we started uh, building that back up, uh, largely because we knew that uh, many of these microbes really thrive on uh, plant uh, fiber. So we're developing this tool as a way to promote compliance. Right. And, and and this is actually uh, related to the study I'm doing with Dr. McDonald. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was funded through the Evans family in GERF and to do this study in um, uh, individuals uh, that um, often are uh, in areas where there are food deserts and, and there's uh, really no... Um, uh, you know where where, where food choices are not uh, are not being made wisely. Can you tell me a little bit more about the study that you're working on with Dr. McDonald? I think we will probably follow up with him in a future podcast episode. But just to get a brief overview would be, I think, because it's really interesting work. So uh, we're going to work with Dr. McDonald in using this set of tools to determine as he introduces dietary 
uh, therapies. You know, he, he does it two ways. One is to try to educate patients on how to cook foods and to make wise choices. Uh, the other way is where he has an obesity clinic that he uh, is trying different measures to try to uh, get them to uh, lose weight. Uh, but I think that a tool like this would allow patients to see that they're moving in the right direction. And then, this, then the weight loss, when it comes, will be a further reinforcement. That is just really so exciting, and I can't wait to talk to him and to hear more about the progress that you're making on that project as it develops. And where can people find you on the internet? I know there's changlab.uchicago.edu. Are you on any social media? When it comes to social media, I really haven't been done very much. I mean, I think I have a Facebook account, and even uh, I have a Twitter account, but I have Actually, I've never used Twitter. You write the papers. You say, you, yeah. if we want to know what doc, what you're doing, Dr. Chang, we should read gastroenterology and inflammatory bowel diseases. I get it. That makes sense to me. So we will always be looking for um, the newest work that's coming out of your lab. So thank you very, very much. It's I'm been a pleasure. Over- Thank you for listening to the first episode of the podcast Visceral from the GI Research Foundation. This episode was written, produced, and edited by me, Anna Gomberg, and mixed by the incredible Mike Collins Dowd, who also composed our theme music. We hope you'll join us next time and rate, like, or subscribe wherever you find your podcast. Until then, visit the GI Research Foundation at gurf.org, that's G-I-R-F dot org, to learn more about how to support the research that treats, cures, and prevents digestive diseases.